Welcome to a Friday hangout right here on One Soccer, and look who's in the captain's chair today. I don't know what I did to get this privilege, but here we go. Gareth Wheeler with you as we wrap up, reflect upon another memorable matchup between Toronto FC and the Montreal Impact. Back-to-back -back nights, a Canadian team features in a 4-3 thriller this time around. Toronto FC get the best of Montreal in Group C action at MLS is back. Joining me on today's show, Laura Armstrong from the Toronto Star. Hey, Laura, how are you? Hey, guys. Arcadio Marcuzzi from Montreal. He's the color commentator, the voice of the Montreal Impact on 98.5 Radio. What's going on in Quebec today? Drowning your sorrows, Arcadio. Yeah, we're pretty sad today, but uh, good, to, good to be with you guys. And good old reliable Mr. Prognostication for the CPL restart, Oliver Platt. <laughs> Mr. Six out of 10 himself here every day. <laughs> hey, I take a six out of 10, buddy. <laughs> Good old reliable. So let's get to it. It was a night with some twists and turns. A new hero is being crowned in Io Akinola. The 20-year-old from Brampton scored the hat trick on, uh, on Toronto FC's way to victory, but nothing was straightforward. Nothing was easy for the Reds in this one. L Laura, was the headline coming out of last night's game Io Akinola, or was there something else that caught your eye? Yeah, I think Io has definitely been the headline coming out of this tournament. And for me, it's like a broader, very important moment for Toronto FC in the, fa the fact that they have this young player coming up through the system. And not just Io, like you've got Richie uh, Laria, who's who's playing well. You've got Marky Delgado signed to a long-term deal. Like there's a next generation for this Toronto FC team that I think we're seeing in this tournament that almost kind of like popped up out of nowhere. Like we've been hearing about Io Akinola forever. If you listen to James Grossi, like you definitely know the name and it's like, I, and then suddenly he's here and he's really contributing. And it's nice to actually see that there's going to be like a future for Toronto FC past this group that we're, we were so familiar with at this point. Uh, yeah. A, a hat trick. None of us could have predicted that Ollie. Yeah. There's been this thing with TFC over the years where, you know, there's always a few players coming through that people are kind of excited about and saying, oh, watch out for this guy. And, and until this point, it just hasn't really happened in terms of them progressing to the first team level. So you hear Greg Vanny say, well, I think this generation is the best we've ever had and, and might be a little bit special. And you may be a little skeptical about that. Um, but, you know, Ayakanola I, I started to, del to deliver on it last night, right? And mm -hmm. you look at Jaden Nelson and Jaquiel Marshall Rutty and guys like that as well. And, and maybe this finally is a generation of players that can make a meaningful impact on the first team. Mm -hmm. Arcadia, what were the he headlines in Montreal today? Was it anything about Akinola? Was it all about the impact? No, it's, I mean, it's obviously about the, the impact's performance, but Akinola is, is right, you know, right underneath it. He's it's been, it's been amazing since the start of the tournament. Yesterday, he was the, the MVP of the match. Uh, and what a surprise, you know, that, that young man, 20 years old, uh, five goals in two games, uh, I think, uh, as, as Laura mentioned, the, the future seems right uh, for Toronto, especially with when you see uh, Josie's, you know, stint at Toronto probably coming to an end soon. You, you have that kind of young backup there. Uh, it's pretty, it's, it must be pretty reassuring for everybody in, in Toronto. The game was screaming out for a match winner because Montreal with more shots, more possession. They forced Toronto FC to change formation. So, Arcadia, was that the difference in this game for you, the fact that there was a little bit more cutting edge up front for Toronto FC than there was for Montreal? Yes, I think the, the, the main difference in the game was the, 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 the poor tenure of Montreal's defense. You know, I think four of those, four goals were avoidable. Uh, you know, I don't want to take any credit away from, uh, from Richie Laria or, or uh, Ayo Akinola, but Montreal's defense was very porous last night. Uh, for a derby, you know, they, they lack passion, they lack uh, engagement. And I think that was the main uh, storyline, you know. They managed to come back in the game. Offensively, they showed a little bit of uh, intensity, a little bit of attitude, contrary to what they did uh, against uh, the Revolution. But uh, it wasn't enough. It, it's not good enough. And uh, they, they really need to show something better against DC if they really want to have a, a little, a small, tiny hope to stay in the tournament. Laura, I'll come to you next. I mean, aside from Akinola, we'll, we'll, we'll discuss Io and perhaps his international future in a few moments. But what was the difference for you in last night's game? Um, I, I love seeing the way that uh, Piatti and Pasuelo are linking up. I also think, and I hate to agree with Kurt Larson. You guys know that I hate to agree with Kurt Larson. <laughs> but he did tweet the other day or that 
it was going to be a close game. And I think it was a little bit closer than the scoreline sort of said. And what I would take from it if I was TFC and I was like looking at improving is that those two goals that they gave up were awful. Uh, Gonzalez was many steps behind. Chris Mavinga is just body checking people in the box again. Like we got to quell that. Um, and this is the second time that they've sort of leaked a few goals. So I, I would be like a little bit concerned about that. But I do think that the potency of um, Pozuelo and Piatti, the way that they seem to be linking up so early and so well together is great. And the fact that a kid like Ayo Akinola can, can seemingly keep up with them, I think is going to be huge for the front line. Yeah, to be honest with you, I thought CFC looked tired. And I don't want to take anything away from Montreal, but I, I just felt that CFC... In the first half, they were getting stretched out when they didn't need to. You could hear Vanny on the sideline, don't chase, don't chase over and over again because they were they were pressing when it didn't really make sense to and opening themselves up. And, and that created those straight balls through to Kyoto, uh, who was a handful. And then in the second half, you, you know, TFC essentially just bunkered. You know, they brought on Lawrence Simon, went to a back five and... And I think they were saying to Montreal, we don't think you can break uh, you can break us down if, if we just keep our defensive block in, in place, right? And and that was nearly proven right in, until the goal at the end. Um, so it was a bit of a strange game. I, I thought that when CFC got the ball, they looked, you know, much the superior side and, and like they could cut Montreal open, but they just didn't seem to have the gas in the tank to really sustain that and, and had to do quite a bit of defending. Okay, let's pick it up from, from there. I, I know this is almost like a preseason. That's what Thierry Henry said post-match. You're going to see mistakes as these teams are still building. They're still growing. They're still coming together after the restart. So, Ollie, how much can we gauge about the quality of both these teams by virtue of what we saw last night? Or is it far too early to make any widespread assessment of how good or how poor they actually are? Uh, I think you can see a fair bit. I, I think in Toronto's case, you can see there's a ton of attacking potential. Um, as Laura said, Piatti and Pozuelo, they've really gelled together quickly and, and look really dangerous. Akinola's been a breakout player. Altidore, when he comes back, you would think would make that attack even more dangerous. Defensively, there's still issues, right? They, they still struggle, as, as I said, to just keep in their defensive shape. Um, they get opened up too easily. So, so there's some of the things. I, I don't think there's been any massive surprises with TFC. I, I think we all, all knew that that would probably be the case. Uh, and with Montreal, it's, it's very early days. Um, I don't really know what their best system is. I'm, I'm not sure what the best combinations of players are in certain areas. I, I think they have some really nice pieces. You know, Maciel is another one who looked good last night. He was a pleasant surprise. Kyoto looks like a steal. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's some pieces there, but it, you, I just don't think Thierry Henry has, has figured out how to put them together in, in the best way yet. I think a team like Montreal, they looked good the, in the what two games that we saw them play in March. And, and that's the kind of team that needs this time to gel. And I think that this is the kind of team that really uh, doesn't really takes a bigger hit from this break than a team like Toronto FC. Toronto FC generally, like the pieces, those guys have been playing together for a very long time. It's a very veteran team. They all sort of know how each other works. So it's easier to pick up where we left off. And it's not to say that these guys haven't necessarily been dealing with each other in, uh, on the on the training pitch, but certainly they haven't been playing games together and you learn a lot from playing games. And I think that that break for them is not good. I think it's, you know, it's easy, particularly I'm sure in Montreal to be disappointed when you lose a derby because it is a derby and this derby means so much to, to these fans. But Thierry Henry, I mean, I think it, it's too early to tell and it's too early to be sort of making huge judgments on what he's doing because as you said like I mean he's got good pieces but he hasn't really had the time to figure out how they work on the pitch against another team. Arcadio? Yeah I agree 100% with Laura and you know uh, the, the the tactical intentions of Thierry Henry are, aren't still clear I think he's still trying to figure it out with what mm-hmm. he what what he has under his hand. Um, we've seen some some good you know, stuff from the players. Maciel was a great surprise, as Oli mentioned yesterday. Uh, but I think a player like Boyan needs to bring more to the table offensively. Uh, a guy like Tider as well, aside from his two uh, two penalty goals yesterday. Uh, they're high salaries, you know, they have high status in the team. And offensively, I think they, they need to, to step up their game in order for the Montreal Impact to do better. I want to come back to the impact. There's a good discussion to be had, and we'll make sure we get to it, about Thierry Henry and the way that he's using the players in the team. Because for me, that's the biggest talking point and something that he's kind of avoiding in the post-game discussion. But let's turn it back to to TFC because a couple real positives stick out. 
One, Michael Bradley made his way through two 90 minute plus 90 minute games over the past four days, which is pretty crazy for a player coming back from some serious injury. I'm with you, Laura. Piatti and Pozuelo, the way that they've connected, really adds that um, that next level attacking element in the team where they can almost create something out of nothing. I think they might be missing a little bit of pace, someone to get in behind the line on the left-hand side. And now that you have Akinola jumping over Mullins or whoever else was in the in the running to be Josie Altidore's successor or, or player that can step in up front, really there's not too many questions about TFC from an attacking perspective, is there? No, Ollie, or go to you or Laura, go ahead. No, yeah. Go ahead. Um, no, I mean, I don't think there is questions about it. And I think that they have a really nice mix right now of Braun. Like one of the things that I really liked about Io and in the, in the, in the, the ways he scored his goals was that, the, was that they were different. There were a couple instances over the two games where he just found himself at the right place at the right time. He was keeping, he, he was keeping up with the playmakers. There were a couple of really nice goals, a couple of really nice takes. And then there was um that that th that third goal that he scored against Montreal where he bullied um the Montreal defender off the ball and I thought like that's Josie Altidore yeah. like uh, 10 years ago right like and I think that that it's really impressive um that they have all of those I still think that there are question marks in the in the back line like I think that's where the question marks are going to come from I think Ollie's right um you look at a guy like um Omar Gonzalez last night and you think like it kind of reminded me of Drew Moore a little bit. Like Drew Moore was always like very good at positioning himself, but he wasn't going to win in a foot race. He would generally put himself in a good position to not be in a foot race, but you got to make sure that you're, you're making those adjustments as you get older. And I think that there's a few concerns about the back line for me, but in terms of like the attack, TFC has really always been good about that. And the fact that they're bringing in reinforcements is huge. Yeah, I, I agree to that. Not much to add, really. Um, I, as you said, Wheels, I think there's there's an opportunity on the left wing because Piazzi and Pozuelo and Arrow as well, they take up so much attention and they really drag a lot of players over defensively. If you can find someone like a Kyoto who's fast and direct yeah. and, and can make the most of that space on the left, um, I, I think that could be a pretty effective player. On the other hand, you, you do get a lot of defensive work from, from Endo that kind of balances the midfield a little bit. So maybe there's an opportunity there for, for someone like a, you know, Jaden Nelson or, or, or a player like that, even an Erickson Gallardo, although we haven't seen um, his best form yet, but yeah, they, they look dangerous up front. And, and that's the thing. I, Greg Vanny really likes Aro playing down that right-hand side. That was one surprise that mm -hmm. Richie Larea started down the left, typically a right-sided player because he really likes that Aro Piatti Pozuelo connection playing down the right hand side. And obviously Jonathan Azorio is not in the team. And with the way that they're playing with two central midfielders now, not three, essentially um, it begs the question what his role will look like when he's back to full health as well. The, the big discussion on the Fox broadcast last night, they broadcast the game south of the border was when Io Akinola joins up with the U S men's national team, assuming that he'd already decided to play a senior football with the U S men's national team. Let's talk about some of these Canadian players and let's talk about Io specifically. I mean, this Canadian team is blessed with, con with attacking talent. Now, all of a sudden, where do you think his future may lay? internationally ollie is he best suited for the u.s is he best suited for canada or even nigeria also he's eligible to play in that country as well yeah well this was a talking point a couple of years ago when i, I think i scored maybe in a canadian championship game but he hadn't been listed on the team sheet with a little maple leaf next to his name and and someone asked greg vanny afterwards you know is he canadian or american and and he was pretty annoyed to be honest that canada hadn't made a ton of effort to try and recruit him um so that that was pretty early in, in John Herdman's reign. So you would think that, you know, he's he's been pretty aggressive with the dual nationals and has, has probably tried to address that situation since then. So we'll see. But I, I really think I, I think Greg Berhalt is gonna want him for sure. Um you look at Josie's lack of health and you just look at the the type of striker that Berhalt likes, you know, in Columbus and with the national team. He's he's had Giassi Zardes, that kind of six yard box striker, good movement. It's very much like Ayo Akinola, right? Who, who's always in the right place at the right time and, and has the athleticism and the reading of the game to, to keep up with the playmakers. So he, he would be a great fit for the US. Obviously, I hope it's Canada, but, but we'll have to wait and see. Um, I kind of feel like he, 
he is the kind of striker that Canada could really benefit from having because I think that Davies and, and David, they're kind of, they're, they're quick and, and they're, they have a lot of finesse. And I think that Canada could use a little bit more brawn up front. I think that we like, you know, they, there's not always, the country doesn't, sometimes it goes too, too straight, but I think it's nice to have that straight long ball option. And I think that he is such a presence that it would be great for Canada. But we were talking about this earlier and like, I was sitting there watching thinking, is he going to get into the Canadian team? Like if I'm, <laughs> I'm, Akinola, I'm thinking yes. to myself, like, I want, I want to play on Canada because like, why wouldn't you want to play on the, the play with this group of players that's coming up um, through the Canadian system right now. But then it's like, it begs the question, like how many strikers can John Herdman carry? And how many times are we going to like send Alfonso Davies into defense or left wing or whatever? Um, so I don't know. I kind of thought to myself, like, he's going to, he's got an uphill battle. And, and I, I, if I was him, I'd be going for Canada, but like, when are we ever in this situation? When is Canada ever like, nah, we don't need them. Like that's not. No. Not that I don't think that you know just cements that Alfonso Davies is playing left back for Canada moving forward. Yeah, like yeah. We're in a different spot. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think uh, he'd fit in both teams uh, and probably in Nigeria as well. That kind of talent, you you don't you know, you know uh, look uh, high on it. And I think you know uh, it's going to be a lot of back channeling going. Maybe the American players at TFC, uh, uh, Josie Alta, they were probably a big brother figure to him trying to convince him to, to go with uh, the American program. Uh, he's in Toronto, so basically everybody else uh, trying to, to convince him to, to join Canada. Uh, if he doesn't join Canada, which I, I truly hope, uh, then I really want him to go with Nigeria because uh, it would be sad to see him with uh, the American jersey on. Yeah, well, with Pulisic and a lot of the young American, like it, it looks like a pretty complete team. But the one spot, ironically enough, after Altador, they're very thin, is up top. And, um, and this isn't just two games from Io Akinola. He was supposed to play for the U S at the under 20 world cup last summer. So this isn't just a player coming out of nowhere. Um, some so-called, or I guess he calls himself an expert is saying that Richie Larea for left back for Canada. I, I, I just think it was more about circumstance. He was playing down the left-hand side than anything last night. Richie Larea is a right-sided player. Can we all agree upon that? Yeah, I think so. But what I'll say about Richie Larea is, I think maybe there was a feeling when he came in that, you know, okay, didn't work out for him in Orlando as a central midfielder, but he's a great fit at right back and he can be kind of a role player in that one position. Well, now he's played right back, he's played right wing, he's played left back. The guy's just a good footballer and I don't know how Orlando can see it really. You know, wherever you put him, he he does his job and, and I think he, he probably could play left back, but yeah, I prefer him on the right. Does anyone uh, and does anyone believe that TFC can go on and win this tournament now after what they've seen through two games? I mean, uh, like, I feel like I've learned never to bet against them. Like they're just that kind of team that, like, every time I think to myself, like, ah, maybe this year is not their year, they go and do something that, like, they. I think that TFC, better than almost anybody, understands how to play major league soccer. And I obviously this version of major league soccer looks different. And I think that they're going to struggle because of the time frame. but everybody is, but I don't know this team, like remember when they were in the MLS cup last fall and we were all like, what the heck are you guys doing here? But they were like, yeah, we knew. I was like, okay, sure. So yeah. I, I won't bet against them. I just, I've learned my lesson. They've got the quality for sure. It's, it's just a case of can they deal with the schedule and, and the, you know, the fatigue for me. Um, it's not the youngest team in the league and, and in certain areas, as we've spoken about before, they, they don't have a ton of depth. So can they keep rolling this, this 11 out and, and can that 11 players deal with you know, how difficult the schedule is going to be? Uh, Arcadio, yeah, go ahead, Arcadio, go ahead. Yeah, no, I just wanted to say that the, the Achilles heels from uh, Toronto seems uh, obviously to be the, the defense, lack of depth maybe. Uh, physically, they, they seem gassed. Uh, you know, uh, second half uh, against DC was the case. Uh, against Montreal a little bit, they, they took, the, the, they took the, the foot off the pedal. And it could have uh, it could have stung them because Montreal, they missed two uh, good chances uh, late in second half when, when Jackson Hamel... Uh, yeah. Came into play one one header from Jackson right uh, on the keeper, and then Boyan missed that that goal that you know he, he should bury. bury. So uh, I think I think they should be better at defense. I think I think they should manage games a, a little bit better as well. But I think they can grow in that tournament, and and if they can find that that kind of right balance, 
it's Toronto, as, as um, Laura mentioned, you know, they, 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 they always seem to find a way to, to get to the latest instance of uh, any type of competition. Arcadio, I want to turn our focus on the Montreal Impact now. I was actually quite pleased by the way they played last night, to be honest, but it's the same old story or what's been the story since Henri took over at the start of the year. How does he best utilize the players at his disposal? Because there's some real talent in the team, but it's about getting it right. And back-to-back games at this tournament, he's put out a team to start a game that simply hasn't worked. Whether it was Piet on the right-hand side, Shami Chom on the right-hand yeah. side, Wanyama playing center back, that cannot be the best way to get the most out of that player. What do you make about the way the team's been lined up? Because for me, it's been wrong both games. It's He's had to adjust and the team's inevitably looked a little bit better. But uh, what, what do you make of, about the way that Henri's utilized his squad this far? Yeah, it's true that he, he had to, to adapt because of injuries, because of, you know, many factors, uh, lack of fitness and, and this and that. Uh, we're still like in a kind of a preseason mode, but uh, I think at some point he, he will, will have to settle with uh, a formation, with uh, keeping the players at the same position and, and try to, to make them look good, are, are, you know, where they play best. And uh, Wanyama yesterday who played center back, but he, he was probably one of the best players on the field for the impact. But you, you kind of missed what he brings to the table in terms of uh, uh, offensive transition and all that, uh, which he did against, against the Revolution, where he was probably the only Montreal player who had a, a solid match. So, and that, that's a good example of, you know, where to, 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 to put the players, uh, give them that confidence and, and give, give time to the squad to gel and to find out their marks because the players seem a little bit lost in translation. Uh, in, in, in the intentions of Thierry Henry. And as you mentioned earlier, he, he hasn't been able or he doesn't really want to uh, explain what, what he wants to do to, to the press. Uh, he, he says that uh, it's still too early, that uh, uh, the, the lack of intensity is the, the main problem. But at some point, I mean, uh, he, he should be clearer on, on what, is, what his intentions are. Well, Arcadio, I want to get, get your thoughts on this and go to Laura and, and, and Ali, but... This team, like when I look at the team, just the squad on paper, there's like seven or eight central midfield players. <laughs> there's nowhere near enough on the on, on the on the wings. And the, the players available at the back aren't world beaters either. So it just looks like there's an imbalance in the team. And I don't know if Von Rie can work his magic and come up with something. I just think the way the squad is built, it's flawed. And there isn't enough yeah. in some critical positions. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I think that that... It goes back to to uh, Remy Guard's tenure when uh, you know the, the they lacked time. They were in a transition with the sp- all the whole the whole sporting st- structure. The there wasn't a real um, uh, general manager in the team or sporting director. So all the recruitment was kind of made the last minute, uh, trying getting players here and there, more by by convenience than than a real need, you know. And and I think Thierry Henry uh, inherited that. And now Olivier Renard is trying to do a good, a good job. I think he's been do- doing a good job in recruiting. And it's going to take some time, I think, to, for, for, for Thierry Henry to get the, re- the pieces he needs to, to put in place where he really wants to put in place. Yeah, I, I think part of it is just on relearning what he's got as well. You know, I'm, I'm not sure if he knows, really knows his squad yet. Um, you know, he, he seems to want to play that back three and wing back system, but he doesn't really have any standout wing backs except maybe Zachary Broguillard, who hasn't been in, in the lineup. I, I think he has some good attacking wide players between Okonkwo and Kyoto and Lapalainen, but he, he seems to want to play a two up front and, and no wingers. And when he did play with wingers, it was, it was Boyan out there, who I think is much better down the middle. So uh, there's just been some decisions that suggest to me that he's still kind of learning about his players and, and doesn't exactly know all of their strengths and weaknesses yet. Laura, anything that? Yeah, I kind of think that, like, as a manager in general, Thierry Henry, the jury is still out on Thierry Henry. And, like, that, in, it hurts my heart to criticize him. Like, I'm an Arsenal <laughs> fan, right? So, like, let's be clear. This is very <laughs> I think the jury is still out on him. And I also think that it, it is a little bit concerning that you have a new coach coming in and you're already – we're, you're already concerned about that he's not getting enough out of the players just in terms of desire. Like, it, this is supposed to be the situation where you're fighting to still be in Thierry Henry's team, right? And and that's not happening. So why is that? Is there a communication issue? Why is there, there are players that are um, maybe 
not as fit as they should be. I mean, there's no reason that you shouldn't have been training in the, in your time off, right? You should have been prepared to a certain extent, maybe not match fit, but you should have been able to at least get on the, on the pitch. Right. So I think that there is a certain amount of concern for me before he even sort of figures out tactically where he stands, um, that, that he's not getting enough effort out of the players. And I think that you would have appreciated Montreal's, um, what Montreal done in this in this tournament a lot more if they showed a lot more intensity because they really have been lacking that and that's on him as much as it's on the players. Is that your read as well, Arcadio? Well, yeah, I think uh, coaches and players have shared responsibility on what, what happens on the pitch. Of course, I think the players need to be more accountable, but uh, there's a, there's a part of responsibility that's uh, on, on Henry, Henry's shoulders as well, for sure. Uh, we got about five five minutes left. Uh, I thought they worked hard last night, but aside from um, Kyoto, who I thought was excellent, I think that he's got to be first choice ahead of your Arudi up front. I just, I don't see what he likes so much in Arudi. And then you play maybe a tight air or a Boyan in behind is kind of that, that striker that works around. I think that you have something there to go about getting these pieces together, but Maciel, Piet, and Wanyama, those are three players that prefer to play in a deeper position. Can all three of them play together? Like this isn't Liverpool, right? Where you have guys that are runners. Like I just like I'm not sure why you recruited Wanyama to come into this team when you have players that kind of play a similar role and maybe a little bit of a different way. Arcadio, I think your recruitment's just wrong. Yeah, I mean, it, it's hard to say that that Wanyama is a is a bad signing, but uh, it, it's it's true that that it wasn't a, a a need, you know, right now for the impact. I think it was an opportunity, and and they just went for it because I think for obvious reasons the quality of the player. But uh, it brings question marks. It brings a puzzle to the table. Where do you put Piet? Where do you play Maciel? Uh, you, you're totally right. I think Maciel can play a little bit more forward. Um, with, with I think he's got a good vision. Uh, physically, I don't know if it, if he can be a, a more offensive midfielder in MLS. It's kind of difficult. But uh, I think he, he should be giving a shot. But at the same time, right now, Piet is being moved away uh, from, yeah. uh, you know, the right wing back from uh, it, it's it's terrible uh, it's it's sad for him because uh, it's he 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 shines at his position yeah. right right uh, in front of the defense and uh, it's too bad for him for his development uh, hopefully he can learn a lot from play, from a player like Wanyama and it comes compensates from what he, he can do on the pitch right now but uh, we 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 need to hope that uh, we we find uh, Thierry Henry find solution sooner than later from for Samuel Piet. It's Piet yeah. needs to sit in front of the back line and just sit there and win balls yeah. and distribute. That's Absolutely. it. Uh, he's, he's played everywhere except there, right? <laughs> like he, he's exactly. played right wing back. He's played in a higher midfield role. Just he, he he's a six. And I, I, as we said before, I think it would be a lot more effective in midfield if you had a back four rather than a back three, and then Piet in front of the back four giving them protection. Then you don't have too many players playing deep in in, in the center of the field. D- did it feel like a? typical derby match for you guys you know considering it was played in front of no one or a few hundred people no um, not really sorry Ollie. I think no, go it, ahead. it's it's difficult uh, without fans of course you know the fans make a derby you know of course uh, the players the intensity a little uh, push and shove here and there uh, it's 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 nice but um, it doesn't feel like it and it's been like that for a couple of years i think um, especially since on, on montreal side uh, on Toronto side, we, we feel like guys like Bradley, guys like Josie, uh, you know, uh, Jonathan Osorio, they know what it means uh, to play a derby. They know, they, they feel that rivalry. Uh, Montreal has been such a revolving door in terms of players that, you know, the new guys uh, doesn't really know what is it. You know, they, they, they don't hate Toronto's players. Uh, they, they haven't been knocked out by, by Josie Altidore or midair. So, I mean... Uh, it, it, it changes the, the, the paradigm. So I, I think the, yesterday was a, a good starting point, a good starting block for many of them to kind of feel and, and start, you know, living that rivalry. And hopefully in, in the following months and years, uh, it, it becomes what it was a few years ago because it, it was the best rivalry probably in North America. Yeah, yeah that, that's the thing, right? Like the, the the Montreal players that played in the 2015 and 2016 playoffs and the 2017 Canadian Championship, that team's gone. Like who's left? Evan Bush and, and Tabler? I, I don't think there's anyone else really. So yeah. it's, it's a completely new Montreal team. And, and I think it takes time, right, to kind of build that contempt for each other. Uh, and, and it takes big games, which which just haven't happened yet. I think it means more to the fans. Laura, you've been around for a long time covering this team. Canadian Classique, no one calls it that. 
Yeah. No one. I, where does this come from? You can't just make up a new name for a derby. I don't get it. I hate the 401 derby, though. Like, I Why? hate that name. I've always hated it. I don't know. Like, it's a road. Like, what is it? I don't know. I don't know. It's the only way between the two cities. I don't like the Canadian Classic. I hate the Canadian Classic, and I hate making stuff up for sure. But I don't know. I feel like it could be. I feel like it really could be better. I also think that, like, no derby is ever going to feel like a derby when, Canada, like, Canadian teams are playing in hot, hot Florida. I feel like it either has to be March <laughs> or November. Like, it can't be, like... <laughs> Marky Delgado can't be like sweating right through his shirt. Like it's not, it, it's way too Amer too Floridian for us. Arcadia, what do you call it in Montreal? Uh, the the, the cl cl classiro. Some people call it like a class syrup, you know, for uh, maple syrup, which I think I don't like it. <laughs> uh, yeah. I, I call mean, it I the Canadian one. classico because uh, I like classico. I'm from, you know, Latin America. So for me, a derby, it's a classico. But uh, yeah, I, I, I agree with Laura. I don't like 401 Derby simply because the 401 stops in Ontario. It doesn't exist in Quebec. So it's kind of a one way. Uh, but you uh, need to you take the 401 to get to Toronto. Like Yeah, but, but once once we enter Ontario be, before in, in Quebec, I think it's the 40. So I don't know. We, I we like need the to Canadian find... Classico. I think we should go with that. Canadian that Classico. Let's, Can we just let's do it. On the show? Let's go with the hashtag. <laughs> The Upper Canada, Lower Canada, I don't know, it's <laughs> ridiculous. Uh, one final note, our very own Armin uh, Bedakian uh, got some pubs <laughs> south of the border last night. He logged on Twitter, all everything that Greg Vanny said out loud. That was one of the magical pieces. You could hear everything that Greg Vanny says, and he speaks a lot during the match. Uh, shout out to Armin for doing that. Is there something that Greg Vanny said that caught your ear last night that's your favorite, Laura Armstrong? I mean, it's, to anybody who covers Greg, it's not surprising that he talks a lot because he talks a lot when he we do interviews with him. Um, I feel like Greg is generally very like kind of prim and proper with us. So I think that it's great that he swears as much as he does. And also, I think if I'm Omar Gonzalez, I'm like thinking to myself, like, maybe I need to pull up my socks. <laughs> <laughs> Ollie or that, Katie or anything, Dad? There was, there was one moment in the first half where he was just screaming at Omar Gonzalez to move over. And, and Omar yeah. didn't listen. And did he, he just walked, <laughs> yeah, yeah. continued walking. Um, so yeah, that was good. I liked, um, no, you can whack your finger, but he pulled him down as well. That was a good one. Um, a, a lot of enjoyable quotes from Greg Manning. Can you? Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, shout out to Armin for that because it was <laughs> it was hilarious. It went viral, and he deserved it. Uh, it's, it's totally funny. And I, I was we were doing the call, uh, you know, with the with the audio feed from Orlando, obviously in studio from Montreal, and it was painful, painful to have <laughs> Greg Vanny uh, in my ear the whole game. But uh, I mean, you know, at some point he was trying to to uh, convince the ref that uh, it was a red card for like a, a super light foul. Uh, that was super funny, you know. You could see the intensity and really convinced that that it, it, it was red card deserving. So yeah, it's pretty funny. The Omar uh, get over kind of kind of sequence as well uh, was was uh, kind of hilarious. So shout out to to Greg Vanny for putting up a sideshow and shout out for mm -hmm. to Armin for uh, for for yes. that uh, great post. <laughs> My favorite, knowing Greg after all these years, he's all about positioning. He's always thinking two, three moves ahead. And when he said, if we turn over the ball, we're effed. Like that is that is the way that his footballing <laughs> mind works um, because everything's about what's going to happen in the future, not about what's happening in the moment. Uh, great stuff here today, guys. Arcadio, thank you so much for joining us. Laura, you as well. Great seeing you again. Ollie, um, we're on CPL Restart Watch, aren't we? We are. Um, the week is coming to an end, so we'll, we'll see if we, we get it, we hear anything for the rest of the day. But we we might be looking at next week, I think, for for the good news that has been long promised. Fingers crossed. The weather's going to be gorgeous outside. Go to enjoy, and then your focuses collectively can turn to the Canadian Premier League next yeah. weekend. Make sure you subscribe to us on YouTube. Continue to like our content. Tell your friends. Give us a share as well. On behalf of Arcadia, Laura, Ollie, I am Gareth Wheeler. Enjoy the rest of your day, Canada. Remember to stay safe.